Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 57 of the weekly playback. I do anticipate this being a shorter episode because I did not play too many games in the last week, just four. Um, and yes, I got a haircut. Unfortunately, I can never style my hair as nicely as the stylists do after I get it cut. You know, um, when I got my hair cut on Wednesday, I believe it was, they'd like put some nice waves and curls in it with a curling iron. And then I tried to do the same today and instead burned my hand. But I will not give up. I will try and try again. Anyway, I'm sure you guys didn't want to hear about my hair, but I just thought I would mention that if it looks not so great, it's because I just don't know how to style my hair. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about the games that I played. And the first one I'll talk about is currently on Kickstarter, which is Arborea. Is it? Um, so Rado pronounced it Arborea and I tried really hard in my two minute video to pronounce it that way and I kept on having to reshoot every time I kept on saying Arborea because I'm like okay that doesn't sound as nice as Arborea but it, Arborea comes more naturally to me than Arborea. So yeah anyway Arborea, Ar Arborea is designed by Danny Garcia and the art is done by Nico Gendron and Javier Incogolum. Ink Golem, that cannot be his true last name. See that, Ink Golem? I mean, that's really cool. Maybe he changed it to Ink Golem or that's just his like, whatever. This is a prototype copy. Um, so yeah, so this is currently on Kickstarter. It is a really fun worker placement game. Um, so yeah, it's for one to five players and I played a two player game of this. So I'm going to try and like put up one of those like things that like lets you click on it and it'll take you straight to my two minute overview video because I explained the whole game in two minutes. Um, so if you want to know exactly how this game plays, just please click on that first and then come back here. Um, again, I'll try to do that. If I can't figure out how to do that where it just appears in the corner, then I'll have the link below. Cause again, I've never done that before. So, um, you know, I'm still, I know I've been on YouTube for a number of years now, but I still, am like a noob when it comes to YouTube stuff. So anyway, um, this is a fun game. It's a, it's a worker placement game in which you are placing workers on like different tracks and everyone's workers goes go on these pilgrimage tracks. And if someone chooses to push a pilgrimage track, your workers get pushed along with it too. So it's really cool. Um, um, and then there there's like tile placement involved. So you're trying to complete these like ecosystem cards and then you're going to flip them over and you're going to try to place the cards in such a way that you'll be able to get more and more creatures into your own ecosystem and score points. Um, there's all different kinds of resources in this game. Again, I talk about it in my two minute video. So I'm just going to talk about my review of this game and what I liked and what I didn't like. So the things that I liked, I liked how you really have to like try to plan what you're doing in such a way that you have to be mindful that your plans could be totally messed up because resources are a shared resource in this game. So if you gain resources on your turn, the bio, the biome reserve, uh, which is what it's called, um, is where the resources are trapped. And so you move the top half of the resource tracker up the number of spaces that you've gotten that resource the number of spaces for how many resources you've got, you know what I mean. And then if you don't use the resources, you will instead get points. Instead of using those resources, you'll see how many points you get. And then you move the bottom half of the tracker up to meet the top half. And then uh, that will help you to, you know, calculate how many points you get for that resource that you did not use, which you got on your own turn. But then that leaves these resources available for the other player to, you know, perhaps use on their turn. So you can try to, you can look over at other players' board because the ecosystem cards that they have are visible to everyone. They're at the top of their own player board, which I will show you. So here is an example of a player board where you're going to have your different workers and you're going to have three, you can have a maximum of three ecosystem uh, cards at a time that you're working on. So you can see which kinds of cards are on someone's player board that they might be working for. So like, for example, here is one of the more difficult ones, which requires six different resources. So you can like look over and see, oh, they want those resources. So, you know, if you're not able to use those resources, they might get them. And then you're going to have to like hope that someone else acquires those resources on their turn and doesn't use them. Or you're going to have to have some miraculous turn where you come up with all of these resources. The thing is that all of these resources are available in different parts of the board. So you have a pilgrimage track on 
you have pilgrimage tracks and then on each side of the pilgrimage track there are different pathways that you can hop off on so and the different pathways provide you with different kinds of resources so like for example if you want water the only place to get water on this board is on this part of the board so you need to hop off on the bottom section of this pilgrimage track if you want water the only place for you to get those purple things is over here the only place for you to get some green things is over here. The only place for you to get trees, pink trees, is over here. So you need to be mindful of where you're hopping off in order to get certain resources. Um, so you know, there are multiple workers in this game. So you may be able to have such a turn where you prep your workers and make them hop off at the same time and so that you can activate them in the same turn. So you are going to start off with two uh, big workers who always come back to this ready part of the board. And then you're going to start off with two small workers who after they've completed their pilgrimage, they need to go back up here before you can train them as an action, which is available on this board as one of the rewards on one of the paths on one of the trails. Um, so yeah, you'll need to train workers from this side and this side to come down here to be ready to be used again. So on your turn, you're gonna do one of two actions. You can either place a pilgrimage, a, a worker onto a pilgrimage track, or you can push a pilgrimage track that already has your worker on it. So you really have to start planning out like, okay, how am I gonna get these resources? Is someone else gonna use the resources I need? How can I make sure that, you know, if I'm fulfilling a certain card, I have workers hopping off in certain areas to get me as many resources as I need in order to complete those cards so that the game doesn't end. I like that part of this game. Like, I think it makes it tense. It makes it more interesting and strategic for you to try to figure out where you want to hop off and when. And the fact that other players are going to be pushing the pilgrimage tracks as well just adds a more fun element to the game. So anytime a pilgrimage track is pushed, you can make your workers hop off. So even if you're not the one who pushed it, um, you can hop off at any trail that you are current trailhead that you are currently at or have passed. So uh, on this side, the, the pilgrimage track is pushed this way. On this side, it's pushed this way. So like if it was pushed and I was here, I could choose to hop off here or on any of the trailheads that I've already passed. And then as the second part of your turn, because your turn uh, is completed in four different steps, you activate any workers that are on, on trailheads. So you might have three workers that you get to activate and you get to decide in which order you want to activate them, which again will help you to hopefully complete ecosystem tasks, to get those cards into your ecosystem, to hopefully get some creatures. So uh, when you get a creature, first the creatures have to go to the borderlands and anytime a creature goes on the borderlands you get a reward and if you're the first one to place it there you'll get a better reward than what's shown here there's like little tokens that you have to put there they're super tiny by the way and then anytime you take off a creature which you need to be able to you need to go here in order to so see that footprint uh, paw i mean that will allow you to remove a creature from the borderlands and place it into your own ecosystem so you know in order to do things in the scheme you basically have to plan carefully which trailheads you want to hop off on and the longer you stay on a pilgrimage track the greater the rewards you'll get more rewards if you stay on longer but of course you know that will take more time so as you're doing that other players might get more and more stuff as you're spending more and more time on the pilgrimage track before hopping off but you have a fair amount of workers so you're going to have again two big ones let me pull out all the purple ones so you can see the number of workers you'll have. So you're going to have two big ones, which are the elders, and those ones are always ready and come back to the ready part of your player board. Then you're going to have three small black ones, and those are the, um, they're just regular villagers, I don't remember what they're called. And then you have three special white ones, which are the veterans. And these, if you uh, get, activate these in certain parts of your of the player board, the, uh, the the main board, they will get you some more greater rewards. Um, so vet veterans are here, and the regular black ones are here, the tiny ones, and but the two big elders always come back here. And you need to use a train action in order to train them so that they are ready to come out again. And again, that can only be done in one section of the board. And so, you know, you need to plan well in advance 
like what you're trying to do and also be mindful of the tracks getting uh, pilgrimage tracks getting pushed by other players and stuff like that so i really enjoy that part of the game um the only complaint i had about the game really was uh some some of the same complaints that rado had you know the creatures not fitting onto the board um we started putting them at a slant like an angle which kind of helped with that but the creatures are way too big for the board like these are all the different kinds of creatures and this includes some of the expansion creatures which we did not play um because we don't have the board for the expansion but it includes some of those as well another thing that i had a complaint about which it seems like it may be resolved because i saw that it's actually a new stretch goal i believe is that the, some of the components are just so freaking tiny like just super duper tiny let me just find it so i actually even double bag these just in case because i was so worried about them being lost but like here i'll just show you an example like these colors don't match but just to show you like how tiny these are these were the resource trackers so you'd have like a top half and then a bottom half and you would have to move it and it's just so tiny and was such a pain to handle to be honest and i just hated how like easily these could be lost so now they are going to be turned into screen printed little wooden tiny blocks instead but i do wish that these were bigger as well honestly uh the, those who are oh sorry i actually did have one more complaint well not necessarily a complaint but something that we changed so in terms of components and like the actual board those were my complaints oh and then also one of the things on the board just did not make sense to us in terms of the rule book and how it was listed here um, we just think that there needs to be some parentheses placed for number one so anytime the first step that you do is you take an action uh, the first action you do on your turn is you either place a pilgrimage onto a pilgrimage track or you push a pilgrimage track one space. Then you can pay three spirit to do one of those again. This did not seem to, you know, this like line here for us did not mean that. Like it was just confusing the way it was written. So, I mean, I've messaged, uh, you know, the owner of Alley Cat Games, but I know that he has yet to read my messages. <laughs> so I don't know if he'll ever read these, but... Um, but I hope that that gets fixed because it just doesn't make sense to us the way it was written on the board. Um, and we just kept on referring back to the rule book. Um, in terms of gameplay, we played a two player game of it. And as I mentioned before, any time a creature is brought to the borderlands that advances the game and uh, marker. So there's a game and marker. And let me just put these creatures back before I show you that, not creatures, workers. So uh, there is a, the game end tracker is up on here on the player board. Nope, that's the wrong side. So here is the game end tracker. And depending on player count, you're going to place the sun marker in one of those spaces. So for a two player game, it was placed, sorry, not there. For a two player game, it was placed over here. And any time a creature was, uh, sent to the borderlands you would move the sun tracker over one space and once the sun tracker reaches the end the game end is triggered we kept on ending you know we kept on sending so many creatures to the borderlands like it just kept on happening like because there's spaces all in all of the different like um trails for that to happen and so the game end was approaching way too quickly and we just felt like we were not like making any progress in our own ecosystems with the different creatures so we didn't want the game to end that quickly so what we did is um, we actually pushed the sun tracker back five more spaces so as though we were playing a three-player game when in fact we were playing a two-player game so we made the game longer which we were happy with and then when the game ended as you know when it did with the five extra like turns whatever we had it could have been more than five turns because it depends whether a creature was recruited in a certain person's turn or not but you know it gave us more time and then we felt like we had adequate time but where the two player marker actually is neither of us felt like we had adequate time and we really just wanted more time with the game so that is what we house ruled um, but otherwise we both really really love the game um, and I know that a comparison has been made to Butoku, so I will talk a little bit about that because I've also received some questions about that on uh, Facebook and then on Instagram. I don't think there's any comparison to Butoku. The only comparison is visually. Yes, they're both worker placement games with like fantastical creatures in it, but Butoku is a much heavier game. Um, and I think if you want something that is like very bright and bold where the board looks busy, 
um, and you are trying to choose between Botoku or Arborea, or Borea, then um, depending on how much time you have, I would pick one or the other. This does not do away with Botoku for me. Like I still really love Botoku. I think there are different games and they have some different mechanics going on in them. So this does not kill Botoku for me. It does not replace Bot Botoku for me. It's just another fun game with beautiful artwork, like stunning, bright, bold colors that is also worker placement with like fantastical creatures in it. And depending on whether I want to play something heavier or something a bit, you know, not as heavy and how much time I want to spend on a game, then I'll pick one or the other, but it does not kill Botoku for me. I think the only comparison that can be made is that the colors are bright and bold and they have like, you know, fantastical looking creatures in it. Otherwise they're two completely different games and I don't think it can kill Botoku and I don't think it will. Um, so for people who play this game, who've also played Bitoku, you know, I'd be, I'm curious to hear what they have to say. I know Rado said it's a Bitoku killer, but I, I disagree. So I guess once it's published and more and more people play this game, then I guess we can, you know, get a better idea of what people think about that. But for me, it does not kill Bitoku. Um, so yeah, so that was Arborea or Arborea, depending on how you want to pronounce it. So yeah, so this is currently on Kickstarter. The next game I will talk about, I don't know why I said I like that as though someone else is here and ready to talk about games, that is not the case. But the next game that I will talk about is Lisbon Tram 28. Now, if you guys watched a recent video of mine, um, uh, this is a game I received recently from Eagle Griffin Games. So it's actually published by Nebo Games, but Eagle Griffin Games is a distributor of this game. They also distribute, um, Porto, which is also published by Nebo Games, I believe. And Porto is a really great game, which also happens to be Portugal themed. So Lisbon Tram 28 is a 2021 game for two to four players designed by Pedro Santos Silva. And the art is done by Andre Fernandes Trindade. Um, hope I pronounced that right. And again, it's published by Mebo Games. Now this is a route building, like point to point movement, hand management, pick up and deliver game. This was at PAX Unplugged in 2021 and I saw it there and I really wanted to play it. I did not get a chance to play it and it was like really high on my wish list and I just really wanted this game and unfortunately I was disappointed by it. So, so I played a two player game of this and both me and my opponent just were disappointed. Um, to me, it felt like this game needed way more play testing. So you have this big board Sorry if you keep on hearing a ding. It's uh, the spell that the board the game comes with. So um, depending on player count, you'll use one side or the other. So this is the board for a two player game. And on this board, you're gonna have different stops which will have passengers on it. I'll post a picture. And then you're also going to have different stops that are like these oval colored spaces. There's four of them where you can try to get a bonus on your own player board. And then you have different monument locations where you are trying to drop off passengers. So there are four different colors of passengers. There are, and they're all going to be in this bag first. So there's blue, green, red, and yellow. And of course I didn't draw any yellows, but there are yellows and yellows. So those are the four different colors of passengers. The four different player colors are like this dark blue, pink, aqua, and like a mustardy yellow color. Um, you're going to be using these cones to indicate where the monuments are on the board where passengers want to be dropped off at. Um, so this is a player board and unless you upgrade, you can have two, uh, two passengers of each color. If you upgrade, there's different upgrades you can use, um, again, by going to those oval spaces, and I'll explain how you need to do that. That might allow you to get more passengers. It may also allow you to do some other things, like move your tram in extra space, or you know do whatever. There's like four different things you can upgrade. So let me just show you some cards. So here are monument cards. So you're going to have three monument cards in a two player game out in front of you, on the board I mean, and they're available for any player to try to fulfill. So you're going to place a orange cone at the location and then you see which passengers you need to drop off in order to get that monument card. What you're trying to do with these monument cards is uh, make connections. Like So for example, 
And once you place down a monument card, you can't move it. And then if you get a new one, you can place it next to that card. And then in addition to getting the points that are on that monument card, you'll get one additional point at game end for each complete ticket that you have by connecting cards like that. So then like, let's suppose I put this one here. So then that would give me another two complete tickets, the red and the yellows, and I have the blue and the green here. So, but again, once you place a card, you can't move it. So if I then got this one, I wouldn't be able to like shove this to the side and then stick this one next to it. So, you know, you just be, you have to be mindful of where you place your monument cards. So on your turn, what you're going to do is you start with, um, I believe seven cards in hand, seven different passenger cards. So again, they're all going to show you either blue, green, red, or yellow. The different colors of the passengers yeah so just the four different colors so on your turn you can move the tram um and then um you may have to push a tram out of the way so when you move a tram you will discard a ticket of any color and if you want to move it more than one space you have to discard tickets of an identical color for each number of space that you want to move it um, so you're allowed two actions on each turn. If you have to push a tram out of the way, they will get to draw a card from the draw pile, like a ticket card. Um, you can, in any, at any point in time, three cards of one color can be another, they can satisfy the requirement of like, they can be one other color. So like if you didn't have any reds, you could say that three greens are one red. Um, you can drop off passengers at monuments and I just showed I already showed you the monument cards You can pick up passengers So in order to pick up passengers you will stop and then you will have to discard a card for each passenger that is there If you don't have room on your board You still have to be able to pay for all of the passengers at a stop or else you can't pick any of them up When picking up passengers you can push your luck So you would push this bell ring this bell and then the other player would draw an additional passenger from the bag and place it at that stop and and then you have to then have cards for all four passengers otherwise you do not get to pick any up and you know i suppose in a game uh if more people decide to push their luck and they aren't able to pick up all the passengers then there may be a situation where you have more passengers in a certain location but the game starts with three passengers in each location Finally, the last action you can do is take a bonus. Um, so again, you go to one of those oval spots and you have to turn in three cards of that color in order to then activate that bonus on your board. So you would place a token for the bonus that you just received and then it would give you that bonus action that is indicated on the side. And one of them is allowing you more space for passengers. So those are the four basic actions. My opponent and I, we did not like this game. So the game end is triggered once the last face up monument. So you, uh, depending on player count, you place the monument cards, a certain number of them face up in the draw pile and you'll always see which one is coming up next. So you'll have three out and then one face up next to it, which you're not allowed to fulfill at that time, but you can see which one is gonna be coming out. And then the game end would be triggered once the last face up card is put into one of the three slots. We ran out of passengers well before that would have happened. Like there was no more passengers left to pick up on the board, like none. Like, so, you know, maybe we weren't pushing our luck enough. I don't know what was going on there, but we then went on to BGG, to the forums, to see what happens then. And there wasn't even a question about it. So um, I just think that this game does not play well at two players. I did see someone else's review that said it doesn't play well at two players. And so I suppose I'd have to agree with that because, you know, the rule book doesn't address what to do if you run out of passengers on the board, because at no point do you replenish passengers. It's only like if someone's pushing their luck, you get to draw an extra passenger for them to try to pick up. And if they don't, then it may be left behind. Um, you know, in certain instances, if you're trying to pick up passengers and you can't get all of them because you can't fit all of them on your board, then you may have one left behind so you might be able to go there like another player might be able to go there and try to pick up that passenger and push their luck maybe in hopes of getting a second one but really there's no way to bring out new passengers on the board so you're you have a limited number of passengers around the board to pick up and then you're trying to fulfill these monument cards which you're trying to get to as quickly as possible and you know that's just really based on luck like which ones are coming up and which ones are closer to which player it's just it just felt like very luck based with not much strategy and I just think that there are much better train games out there with a similar premise that I have enjoyed a lot more. So unfortunately, this was not a win for me. Um, I really wanted to like this game because I have been to Lisbon and I liked 
you know, going to Lisbon and I don't know that this game had good reviews and I really thought I would just really love it. Um, but I just didn't and I'm sad about that. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's sad when you really look forward to a game and you get it. And then um, in this case, I was lucky that it was a review copy and I didn't spend my own money on it. Um, but this game really made me question why, and I know this is probably going to sound really harsh, but it really made me question why this was even published to begin with, because I think that there are so many other games with a similar premise that I've played that I think, you know, are better. And I know games are, you know, your opinions of games are totally subjective. So there's obviously people who love this game and who have rated it a 10 on BGG. Um, I would not be one of those people. Again, you know, your opinions are completely subjective. But for me, I was like, why was this even published? Like, I just couldn't understand. Um, you know, and this is just like it's a gimmick, you know. Um, anytime like you end up uh, wanting to push your luck or I believe it's when you push someone's tram, I think you also hit the bell or something like that. So there's like two instances in, in the game where you hit the bell, but it's not like that super exciting. So, I mean, maybe if you play with kids, they may want to hit the bell and maybe that would be an exciting part of the game for them. For me, it was just like, eh. Um, so yeah, so I was, you know, I was disappointed by this game. It's not a game I would ever want to play again, even at a higher player count. Um, so unfortunately, it was a miss for me and I'm, I'm sad about that um, because, you know, I did ask the publisher for this game for this review copy and they were really kind enough to send it to me and it's just sad when, you know, it doesn't work out. So I will see if any of my um, Kofi subscribers, because I do have different Kofi, subs Kofi subscription levels, I'll see if any one of them wants it. Maybe I'll, you know, give it away, do it because uh, I have uh, giveaways for my Kofi subscribers. So I might give this in a giveaway if any of them are interested in trying it out. Or if not, then I'll probably like donate it um, to my, you know, to like a local game store or something like that. So that was the other game I played recently. Well, one of the four games I played recently. Um, and then moving on. So yeah, as always, if you guys have any questions about any of the games I talk about, feel free to ask. Um, another game I played recently. Oh no, I just pushed the camera. Sorry about that, guys. Another game I played recently, um, which I've played before and have discussed on this channel, is Mythic Mischief. And Mythic Mischief, uh, let me see if I can just pull up the information. So I tried, I wanted to play with a faction that I hadn't played with before, so, um, which I did, which was a faction that I was not that keen on, to be honest. This is why can I log in? Come on, dude. Okay, Mythic Mischief. So Mythic Mischief is a 2022 game designed by Max Anderson, Zach Dixon, and Austin Harrison, uh, published by IV Games, um, and it's for one to four players. So I describe this as being like chess set in a library with uh, mythical creatures. Um, and you know, the really cool thing about this game is like, not that I've ever done this and we've, it's never happened yet, but it comes with enough components for there to be going, for there to be two games going on simultaneously. Um, so, you know, I've talked about, about it before, so I'm not gonna go into huge detail, but you know, it comes with these nice like dual layered boards where you're going to have like these numbered cubes, which keeps track of, track of your actions. And each player, each faction has actions which are like unique. First you have actions which are similar for all players. And then you have actions which are unique to your own faction depending on what your mythical powers are. So they try to make these actions that fit the theme of the mythical character. So in the most recent game I played, I played as ghosts and I was playing against the zombies. So these are the ghosts. Um, are these the ghosts? Yeah, these are the ghosts, I think. Um, I felt like they might be glow in the dark, but they weren't really glowing in the dark. Maybe you need to put them in front of the light for a while before that to happen. I did not really enjoy playing as ghosts. Um, I think I'd like to go back to vampires or something else the next time I play. Um, and of course you have a library board and you have like different bookcases that you can move around and you are trying to collect your tomes and upgrade your abilities and you're, whoever has the most points by the time, like the tome keeper, because there's going to be three different locations that he's trying to reach um, in before lunch and after lunch. And then whoever has the most points by getting their opponents caught by the tome keeper 
will win. So I made the mistake of focusing more in my first turn, and I was the first player to go, so my opponent was able to boost like his ability or put in a die or do something. He had like some bonus because I was the first one to go. I made the mistake of just focusing on trying to get my tomes without really getting the tome keeper to catch my opponent, and that set me far behind. Like that was a mistake. So now I know going forward, like I need to focus on doing both when I play, not just focusing on capturing all my tomes first, um, you need to also play offensively, I think, in this game in order to have a chance. And that became pretty apparent to me. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, it is a game like chess, so I, I guess I should should have known that. So yeah, so that's a game I played again recently, and it's a game I really enjoy. I really love Mythic Mischief. Um, I just, you know, want to go through all the different factions and then see which one's my favorite. So now I think I've played three different factions. I've played vampires, wizards, or maybe I've played four. I think I've also played as the witches one time and now ghosts. Uh, so moving on, another game I played recently is Cartographers, um, which I used to play a crap ton of during the pandemic, um, during lockdown when that was happened. Um, so Cartographers is a 2019 game. It's designed by Jordi Aiden. And uh, it's, uh, the art is done by Luis Francisco and Lucas Ribeiro, and it's for one to 100 players. <laughs> it's a flip and write game. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about it briefly because I know everyone knows, or almost everyone knows what Cartographers is. We made the mistake, well, I suppose I made the mistake because my friend had never played Cartographers before and he really wanted to try it and I played it so many times and I felt like I didn't really need to look at the rules because like, I'm like, oh, I've played this so many times. But I made the mistake of uh, putting in all of the um, uh, ogres, I think they're ogres or whatever, like the monsters, put in all of the monster cards in the deck and like all of them came out in the first season. It was ridiculous. And I also made the mistake of not just putting in all of them in the first deck, but also monsters from the expansion. So more monsters than the game even called for. And then it's only after we ended up drawing like six monsters in the first season. And then we're like, what is going on? Like, you know, there's no space left on the board anymore for us to even draw our territories because we had six monster <laughs> attacks in the first season. And that's when I went back and looked at the rule book and realized, oops, was not supposed to do that. So yeah, so I um, should have refreshed my memory and read the rule book before we started playing. Um, but yeah, so that was fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, so play Cartographers, which is always a fun game to play. And I've, you know, gotten sheets laminated at FedEx. Um, so really nice quality lamination. So use like wet erase markers. So that's nice. So let's move on to games that I received, bought, oh, no, no, actually before we do that, let's go on to games that I'm backing. So I know I'm utterly broke, um, you know, I'm, I'm like super duper broke at the moment, like seriously, but I'm still an idiot and I'm, back I'm backing a game, which I probably should not be backing. Um, so I'm backing Hollywood 1947, a movie making game of strategy and deception. This is by um, Facade Games. So they have the like book series of games and um they had like salem what are their previous games i think there's it's on their campaign page somewhere so they all look like books the first one in the they, they ever made i believe was salem like something i don't re even remember what year it was so each game has like a year attached to it like they're all supposed to be like from different points in history so yeah there's Salem 1692 it looks like, there's Tortuga 16 something, there's like a glare so I can't really see. Then there's uh, Deadwood 1876 it looks like, and then there's Bristol something, and then, oh here are these years. So then there's Bristol 1350, and so this is their fifth game, Hollywood 1947. Um, I have all of the games. The only one I've actually played so far is Bristol, which I wasn't that huge of a, a fan of. But this game, um, there's a publisher, Bitewing Games. Uh, they recently came out with one of Ryan Courtney's games. And that publisher, he has a YouTube channel. And he said that this is like the best deduction game, social deduction game that he's ever played. I don't know how many social deduction games he's played, but I mean, that's pretty high praise. Um, so that's what's, you know, led me to back this game and just the completionist in me is like, yeah, I need this to complete like the whole set. Um, so yeah, so I'm backing this even though I'm utterly broke and have 
a crap ton of credit card debt, which I'm never ever gonna be pay, able to pay off. So, um, so yeah, so I'm backing this. Um, and then of course I'm backing Arborea um, at the $1 pledge lover, pledge lover, pledge manager level um, so that I can get my production copy of that game. Um, now let's move on to games that I have received. Um, so one of the games that I, so yes, um, again, I am broke, but I, you know, was, I go to, I went to a local game store and I saw this game and it's a game that I really wanted. Um, and speaking of Bitoku, it's from the designer of Bitoku and that is Sabika. Oh, I feel like we match actually. Like it's like the same color. So Sabika is a game where you will play the role of one of the nobles of the Nasrid dynasty who contributed to the construction of the monument um, uh, of the monument complex monumental uh, it looked like the a and the t were far apart sorry the monumental complex of the alhambra and to the carving of the poems that adorn its walls you will also have to trade in europe the maghreb and the near east to generate enough income to pay the demanding dues imposed by the Catholic monarchs. Your final objective will be to appear in the historical text as one of the most influential nobles of the Nasirid dynasty of that time. Cool. So it has like a Middle Eastern theme and it's set in Spain um, and it's from the designer of Batoku and I've read reviews of it that has like a Rondal system, which is really, really good. I mean, this game has fantastic reviews. Um, the rule book is actually downstairs, so I can't show you the rule book or the player aid. Um, sheet or whatever that comes with it but i went ahead and like you know bagged everything so like here are some examples of player pieces it comes with like boats and like different kinds of like uh, meeples like different characters then here are some gold ones um these are not specific to a certain player there's different kinds of resources um here are some examples of cards there's different kinds of cards like poetry cards and stuff like that um i don't know what these are but the round thing is a first player marker, I believe. Um, a bunch of different kinds of tiles like this. Um, comes with like some of these like cool like blue like plasticky things. Um, yeah, but just a bunch of different kinds of tiles and stuff. And here are the different player boards. And then the main board, which is really big, so I'm not sure I'll be able to open it. Um, oh wow, well, yeah, this is huge. Okay. So I think depending on the player count, you're gonna have one side or the other um, because the other side looks kind of like the same. So yeah. So I'm really looking forward to playing this. Um, again, it's from the designer of Bitoku, and I hope it's good. It's gotten really good reviews. Um, and, you know, it comes with different um, language rule books. So, and then also it comes with a nice bag in which you place something. Oh, yeah, different resource tokens. So that is Sabika, which I am looking forward to playing because I've heard good things about it. So I um, really want to see how this plays. Yeah, so that's uh, all I have to show this week. I do have Shem Phillips's new game, which will be on its way to me. So as soon as that arrives, I will show you guys, which is which I'm really looking forward to playing because, you know, and also it's, you know, within the theme of the Middle East and that is going to be Scholars of the South Tigris. So as you guys know, he did Wayfarers of the South Tigris, which I covered for Kickstarter and absolutely loved. Um, and it's also one of my top games of 2022. And I know I haven't uh, posted that video yet. I'm actually thinking of reshooting the whole video, to be honest. Um, so I'm gonna actually going to do that. I'm going to try to do that this weekend to reshoot my whole top uh, 10 of 2022 video, but uh, Shem Phillips is sending me Scholars of the South Tigris to preview, so I'm super excited for that, like cannot wait. So once that's here, of course I will show you guys. Um, so those are all the games I have to show you this week. And as far as um, an update on my life, I've noticed that um, 
or rather my studio, whatever, everything. Um, actually, there's a couple of updates. So the first thing I'll say is that unfortunately, I had mentioned a couple of months ago that I had gotten a job with the publisher as kind of like their marketing, like social media person. And I never mentioned which publisher it was. And now I won't, I won't mention it. <laughs> Some people might have figured it out, though. If you were like kind of like, you know, a bit um, of a, a detective, you might have figured out which publisher it was. And it's a publisher of like these really great like midweight Euro games and I thought it was a really good fit for me but unfortunately with the fun again announcement they said that they had to let me go because it's really put them in a really tough financial spot so um you know I understand it's just really really unfortunate I just really liked having a job within the industry um so if there's any publishers who are watching you know I have editorial experience and you know I often read rule books that have mistakes in them um, you know not just spelling mistakes but like grammatical mistakes uh, rule books that are not consistent uh, with the words they use and stuff like that so if you need an editor I have professional editing experience um, so would be happy to help edit rule books and um, you know, for grammar and consistency. Um, but also if anyone, you know, just wants any like social media help or anything like that, I would love to help out. Um, so yeah, um, I'm always in need of extra income. So, so if anyone's watching and uh, you have any work that you would like done, um, please reach out. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, that job fell through. So I'm no longer working for them. I have noticed that my videos are grainy uh, since I've been shooting in my new studio in my house. Um, so clearly I need to work on my lighting situation and maybe finally start shooting with an actual camera rather than my cell phone. So my next uh, plan is to try to set up my uh, computer that I had bought so that I could actually shoot playthroughs and like actually hook up a real camera and start trying to like create more polished professional looking videos. So I'm hoping to try to start doing that and practice and it might be a while before I get a good video out but I want to practice and try to you know work on improving improving my content because I noticed that like my subscription level just doesn't seem to increase <laughs> so it's like just kind of stuck where it is and then I see these other channels and they have like you know they go from like 100 subscribers to like 10,000 in like a matter of weeks and I'm like great I've been stuck at like 5,000 something for a very very long time and it's just not going anywhere <laughs> so um, but that's not to say I don't appreciate the people who have stuck with me so thank you so much because I you know I make these videos for you guys and for me I guess um, so I do appreciate everyone who has stuck you know by my side even with my like not so great quality videos but I'm gonna work on improving that um, so I guess those are my life updates um, yeah um, so I, the question I want to leave with you guys, um, based on my discussion of Hollywood 1947 earlier, I want to know what is your favorite social deduction game? I don't think I've ever asked this before. Um, I think my favorite social deduction game is Secret Hitler. Um, I have so many fond memories of like playing that with like uh, my gaming group like from years ago we used to have so much fun playing it and then the pandemic happened and then we just you know stopped playing it but it's been a really long time since I've had like a really fun game of Secret Hitler but oh my god we had so many great games of that um, and I would really like to reskin mine to Secret Voldemort um, but you know there's no printer who will actually print out the uh, files because when that was available to download I had actually downloaded the reskin so that I could hopefully um, convert my secret Hitler into secret Voldemort but um, I don't have like a really good quality printer to print out that stuff myself so I wanted it printed at a shop but no shop will do it because of the copyright issues of course so yeah um, but yeah I'm, I'm really curious what is your favorite social deduction game because um, with Hollywood 1947 and this one guy saying it's probably his favorite social deduction game that just got me thinking about that. So let me know. I'm not sure what other social, I mean, I've played a number of social deduction games like Avalon. Um, I still never, I still haven't played with my like big box Avalon, which I would really like to do sometime, especially since the artwork is done by my favorite artist, my, one of my favorite board game artists, Weberson Santiago. What other social, I mean, of course there's Werewolf. Um, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so let me know what your favorite social deduction game is and until next time, bye!